Welcome, everyone. This is Stephen Howard with another edition of Discussions on Great Leadership. And my special guest today is Greg Ward, the founder and executive director of the Center for Respectful Leadership, another fellow author. And welcome, Greg, to the show. Thank you so much. It's a privilege being on. Thank you. My pleasure as well, Greg. And, and you know, everyone gets the first softball question, the first big question here. What does the term great leadership mean to you? Well, thank you for that softball question. <laughs> and I wish I could say it was an easy answer. And, and it depends on what's going on in the world and in my life and who I'm working with. In general, I would say great leadership is being able to listen and engage with others who really see things differently, take it on board and take action on it in a way that is productive and positive. So you would probably agree with me that great leadership is not just in the C-suite, but it can be found anywhere in an organization. Absolutely. From the lowliest person who just joined as a part-time 1099 contractor to all the way up to the most senior level, it applies across the board. Excellent. Then what got you into this field of respectful leaders? Aren't leaders just automatically respectful? I respect it. Don't don't they have a title? We have to respect them and bow down to them because they're the leader. That is a great question. What got me into this is I literally fell into it. I was working, believe it or not, as a professional actor, writer, director, and producer in New York City. And the police department wanted to create a training program using theater as a training tool to help cops deal with people in the public who had emotional issues, mental health issues, and things like that. And what I quickly learned when I started doing that work is that respect between the police and the people they serve is not necessarily a given. And as I started to look around my world and all the people I was interacting with, I began to realize there's a lot of different interpretations of what respect really means and how it operates. And I was always searching for respect myself. And eventually I built a practice around it as a coach and as a trainer. And uh, today I, I'm like the Pied Piper of respect. I just like to talk about it and why it's so very important. I, I think people tend to forget that nobody wants to be disrespected, that every single one of us, regardless of who we are, wants to be respected. The problem is there's some expectations out there around respect, just as you said, oh, I have this fancy title, therefore people should respect me. Well, in some cultures, there is an emphasis on respecting people in authority, no matter how they behave. And that comes sometimes uh, to be just performative. It does, people don't really mean it. But respect is really a powerful, heartfelt, emotional thing. It's not a cognitive, rational thing. So at the end of the day, no, Re leaders don't just have respectful behavior. They have to work at it and they have to, I like to say leaders have to earn the respect of those they lead rather than the other way around. Okay, that's that's great. The uh, but we're kind of living in a disrespectful time, at least in the United States, to say the least. Society-wise, I mean, we're seeing incidents on airplanes and movie theaters and shopping centers and what have you. Is this now getting into the workplace as well? It, it really is, and that's what our research at the center is telling us: that we are now at a level of public discord and disrespect that we haven't seen since the 1960s at the height of the Vietnam War. More people are openly divisive and disrespectful towards those they perceive as disagreeing with them than in the past 60 years. So it's a, it's a big concern. It's an issue that is bleeding over into our workplaces. Uh, the pandemic hasn't helped us any. No. And what we're finding is that you can't, because we're all connected these days, we all know what's going on in the world unless we deliberately hide under a rock and never open our phones and look at social media. We know that there is a lot of divisiveness going on in the world and it's gonna bleed over into the workplace no matter how much we don't want it to do that. 
but it's not just us baby boomers, right? I mean, we're the ones who were disrespectful in the 60s and 70s. And are, are we? And a lot of us have come full circle, I guess, uh, into disrespect. But it's, yeah. it's, every, it's at all ages, isn't it? It is all ages. And what's really interesting is you look back to that time when you and I started in the workplace. There was an expectation that you started at the bottom. You paid your dues. You suffered. You did the scut work. And people treated you like crap. And that certainly is what happened to me. My, one of my first jobs, I was uh, I joined a union and I was treated like it was terrible. I can't tell you how bad it was. And when I complained, uh, the foreman told me, uh, well, get over it. That's just the way it is. You're a newbie. You're going to have to pay your dues. Well, I don't know about you, but I've got three millennial kids. They're highly educated. They're really smart people. And if someone told them they had to pay their dues and put up with a bunch of disrespect, they'd say, uh, goodbye. I go find another job <laughs> elsewhere. So the world of work has changed. Gone is the cradle to grave concept of you're going to have one job for the rest of your career. It's just that's gone. We are now, unfortunately, treated as commodities. Employees are simply commodities. And when things get tough, you lay them off, you get rid of them. And things are good, you start hiring more. But now we're in a situation that if you don't treat your employees with respect and decency and courtesy, which is the right thing to do, but right. if you don't do that, you're going to pay. You're going to lose them. There's going to be reduced uh, 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 performance and, and there's going to be all sorts of problems. So so my argument is why not embrace respect? Why not be decent and civil, even kind? There's nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot of good things that come from it. You won't be seen as weak? Not at all. Not at all. And that's a great question because our research tells us that uh, along with Dr. Brene Brown, I'm sure you've heard about uh, uh -huh. Dr. Brown, uh, that vulnerability, that being willing to admit that you're a human being and that sometimes you make mistakes and you say things that you regret and you're disrespectful in a way that you shouldn't have been. And if you step forward and own it and apologize for it, the respect for you actually goes up. Uh -huh. So only in politics is it perceived as weak. But quite frankly, most of us, when a leader comes to us and says, you know what, I screwed up and it impacted you negatively and I'm sorry and I'm going to try to make it up to you. And it's said genuinely from the heart. Most of us are forgiving people. We'll cut them some slack. And actually what our research tells us, the neuroscience behind it is actually we will get a, a little bit of a dose of oxytocin if our leader does that with us and we will feel better about them and be more respectful toward them. A little brain science behind it as well. Yes, absolutely. So I think it's not just politics. I think it's also cable news yes. channels that don't know how to apologize either, have any humility to them whatsoever. No, no. And, yeah. and that's because their business model is all about doing and saying outrageous things in yeah. order to appeal to their primary audience who will then continue to buy their, the, the, their advertisers' products and services. And, and everything's breaking news. So you got to tune in for breaking, breaking news. This is breaking news. That's, that's, yes. Yeah. Reminds me of the, uh, the story that if everything is a urgent and a priority, then nothing's urgent and priority. That's so right. Quite frankly, that's right. there's nothing urgent about the news. And we all tune it out. We yeah. tune it out. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. We wish more people would tune it out. In one of my books, I actually said that one of the best things I ever did to reduce my blood pressure. I stopped watching cable news about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. and my blood pressure went down within weeks. I, I believe it. Yeah. Occasionally I watch it and start screaming at the TV. And my <laughs> wife, my wife just looks at me like, really, really? really? <laughs> Just Got put enough. on just put on HGTV and watch them re re renovate a house, please. Absolutely, and it, it, it's a real feel good channel. Or in your I, case, you're in, you're in San Diego, right? You could always watch the Padres blow another pennant. Oh, thank you very and, and, much. And yell, yell, yell at that. So go <laughs> thank ahead. you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. As a, as a San Francisco Giants fan, I just had to throw that out there to you. Uh, okay, fine, fine. <laughs> All right, back on back on uh, respectful. I'm, I'm trying to be respectful here too. Uh, yes. Sure, sure. It's not going. It's not. It's not coming across as. I better, I better read your book again. <laughs> um, you talk about respect falling in 
I call it three buckets. I don't. I can't remember if you call it three categories or what. Right? There, three types. Three types. Three types of categories. Yeah. Can you yeah. tell our yeah, audience sure. a little bit about those three sure. types? Well, the the first type is one we all talk about or know about or think about when we hear the word respect, and that's interpersonal respect uh-huh. between two people or between groups of people, and that that is is usually seen in people's behavior and the way they talk with each other and engage with each other and how they support each other or not. So that's, that's very common. The second one is known as informational respect. Okay. And informational respect is, especially in organizations, employees want to know what's going on. And they want their leaders to be as transparent as they possibly can, within reason, about what's up with the company. Are there trends or issues that we need to be concerned about? What direction are we going uh, in? Give me the information I need to do my job so that I can feel I'm contributing to the success of the organization. Interestingly enough, our research says that informational respect is the one that employees care most about, not necessarily interpersonal respect, informational. The third type of respect that we look at in the workplace is called procedural or distributive respect. And essentially what that means is if you work in an organization where you perceive the processes and procedures for dealing with employees, pay, compensation, and benefits, uh, disciplinary matters, and, and the way things are run and operated, promotions, and so on and so forth. If you perceive those things to be fair and open and transparent and done in a, in a reasonably fair and non-political way, then you will perceive that your organization has met in your eyes a level of procedural and distributed respect. So those are the three. Again, it's interpersonal. We all talk about that. Uh Informational, which apparently most employees care about most. And then there's that procedural slash distributive respect. That's fascinating because I was reading recently some research on work-related stress. And one of the five biggest causes of burnout from work-related stress is the perception of being treated unfairly at work. So it's amazing how those two things get linked together there. They really do. And, and, and people don't necessarily label it as respect or disrespect. They, no. just, they just call it, it's not fair. They just, they just say, I don't feel like things are fair. And if there's too much of that these days, as we all know, people will say, well, I'll go find it somewhere else. I'll find a better place that treats me better, more fairly. So that's fascinating. The, uh, did you put any weightage on it? So you said that informational was first yes Interper- was interpersonal second and then procedural yes. third In- interpersonal was second although it depends believe it or not and i i will say this as respectfully as i can <laughs> men tend to not be aware of respect and disrespect nearly as much as women are. We're not aware. We're not sensitive. These no, things? no, no, we, no, no. Our emotional intelligence <laughs> tends to be lacking in the area of respect and disrespect. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. And neuroscience seems to indicate that men are preconditioned. I know I was as a child. Don't cry. Don't show your emotions. Uh, The only uh, emotion you're allowed to show is anger or frustration and and be active an active emotion that that lashes out. So women are not constricted in that way. That's that's one reason. Another, I think, more important reason is women in general are, are newer in the workplace, tend to have been disrespected and tend to have been paid less for doing the same job as a man. There's all sorts of of biases and discrimination against women that they are in a way uh, conditioned to see and conditioned to expect. And it's not like they're not there. They really are there. I mean, we, we know famous stories. I think it was Rocket Mortgage or their parent company did a complete review of all their salaries three or four years ago. And they found out there was like a 15 to 20 percent disparity between the women and men who were doing equal jobs. So they corrected all of that. And then after two years, they thought they had it all corrected. Then they did another comp and benefit analysis. And sure enough, the gap was still there. Still it's like, there. oh, the, yeah. And so it's systemic. It's still there. And women know this. They're not stupid. They can see what goes on. And so they're in a way they're, they're, they're more sensitive to it. They see it more often, whereas men, not so much. 
All right. Well, fabulous conversation, Greg. I appreciate it. Can you tell us uh, where we can find more information out oh, yeah. about the Center for uh, Respectful, Respectful Leadership, leadership. And, yeah. and, your, and your book as well? Thank you. If you just uh, Google Center for Respectful Leadership, you'll, it'll take you right to our site, which is respectfulleadership.org. But just Google the Center for Respectful Leadership. It'll all pop up. We'd love people to join. There's a lot of resources. Once they join, it's free to join. It's, 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 uh, we don't charge anything. We're very respectful in that. That's regard. very respectful. <laughs> <laughs> and there's all sorts of resources and videos. And we have a brand new suite of e-learning programs, self-directed. They're really informational. They've got a lot of guidance. They've got a lot of, um, of tools and techniques, and they're very respectful, and they're fun, and they're animated, and there's all sorts of things, and that's called the Roadmap to Respect. So if you type in Roadmap to Respect, that'll pop up as well, and they're really inexpensive. We wanted them to be accessible to everyone in every kind of organization. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, and more importantly, thank you for sharing all that research and information with the, thank with you the world, very much. basically, so we appreciate it. Thank you. As you can probably tell, I love doing this work. Good. Good on you. Well, we hope to have you back, have another conversation about it down the road. Thanks a lot, Greg. Thank you so much, Stephen. My pleasure. All the best.